Good evening, everyone. This is Brother Mick Smith, First Gospel Church, Little Rock, Arkansas. It's good to be back on our Thursday evening broadcast again today. Uh, I'll give this just a moment for people to get logged in and uh, to get online with us. <laughs> Beautiful day in the Arkansas, Little Rock, Arkansas today. It's been a beautiful last couple of days for sure. Anyway, God bless you all and would like to welcome you and grant, greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and our Father. Um, appreciate everyone today. Um, and uh, the work of the Lord that God is, has given us, the day that we're living in, uh, we're certainly, I feel, approaching the, the end of the Gentile world. Not that it's going to happen right away. If you've watched any of our last broadcast, you know that I have went over a succession of prophetical events that has been prophesied and that will have to take place um, prior to the Battle of Armageddon or the end of the Gentile world. So we've got quite a few things. I'm not going to go over any of those things again. I will just mention to you that the church will have to be restored before the fullness of the Gentiles come in. God will graft the Jew back in to, as a tame olive branch into a tame olive branch. Um, the uh, image of the beast will uh, mark of the beast will have to be set up, and the image will have to be made once again. Um, the United States uh, will go down in judgment um, and the uh, um, 10 kings will have to uh, come into existence. They don't have a kingdom as yet, the scripture says, but they will come into existence and take, take control the last part of the last prophetical hour. So there's several things that has to take place. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a, common thing in, in religion today, I'm talking about Christianity, that uh, where preachers are saying Jesus could come tonight, but that's not scriptural. Jesus is not coming tonight, and he's not coming this week, this month, or this year. Not in judgment and in finishing his work. He's not coming for his to make up the remainder of his bride are to finish the work in the Gentile world, there's a lot that has to take place yet. Uh, he may come for you or for me. Remember Jesus told his disciples, he said, your time has, is always. In other words, um, we could, you know, the we, we could, uh, we don't know. We don't know our last day here on this earth and we don't know uh, what the future is altogether for ourselves. I would like to, I'd like to become as <clears throat> important enough to God, and I'm certainly not saying that I am, but that would, that's my uh, desire. Uh, like the Apostle Paul, when the angel told him if, when he was in shipwreck on his way to Rome, and the angel told him, you're not going to die and uh, you still have a work to do. The apostle John, the angel told him, you must prophesy to another people. Oh, you, some people in God's plan have became important enough to him that uh, their time wasn't always. Anyway, uh, I wanna welcome everyone that's here. Uh, not only the saints here in Arkansas, but everyone abroad that is getting on. Hi, uh, Sister Layton, it's good to see you're on there with us again this week. 
and all of you that, that are getting on from the Dominican Republic and from uh, different uh, areas in the United States and abroad. Um, anyway, I, I, um, I was thinking of maybe saying a few things here today out of the 24th chapter of Psalms. If you turn in your Bible with me. Um, you know, I'm trying to hold these uh, broadcast uh, about an hour or, or less. You know, I don't want to uh, take advantage of anyone. And and uh, so and I'm trying to be careful in what I say when it's live like this going out to everyone. Uh, I've had a little bit of a check feeling uh, in myself that um, you know, I, I want to be careful about saying anything that is extremely controversial among the brotherhood, the ministry that, you know, are my brothers and, and the body of Jesus Christ. I don't want to, uh, I, you know, it's not that I feel so influential that I would influence people, saints, against maybe something they teach but I'm trying to stay away from anything that is extremely controversial. And, uh, and I'll tell everyone that's listening, if you're not under my ministry, we'll uh, listen to your pastor and support what he teaches and wait until the Lord helps us to come together on anything that we're not together on. We're still working on the truth of the word of God. And uh, I feel it's very important that we uh, endeavor to keep the unity of the faith in the in the bond of peace until we come into the unity of the faith uh, uh, through the knowledge of the man Christ Jesus until we come to perfection in that and in a restored church. So, anyway, if you'll turn with me to the twenty fourth chapter of of the book of Psalms, we've used this chapter to show that this is, you know, we've used it to show that it's the latter house or the, the um, uh, restored church in our day. The 15th chapter, uh, I believe it says, who, who shall abide in thy holy hill? Uh, let's see, in this chapter here, uh, it says, who shall ascend into thy holy hill, or who shall stand in thy holy place. Anyway, let's start with the first verse. i uh, just like to say some things about it, about where we're at today and, and what our, our hope and our uh, desire is. Uh, the first verse in Psalms 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Don't ever let anybody and don't you ever get to feeling like that somebody else is in control. The Lord's in control. This is his, the earth is his, the fullness thereof. God's in absolute control of everything. Everything that's going on today, Jesus and his father is in control of it. And uh, uh, nothing's going to happen outside. He's not going to be caught uh, off guard. Uh, there's nothing happening. This pandemic that we're uh, experiencing is not anything that God's, not only is he not aware of, I'm sure that God is using it today. He may have absolutely designed it, but if he didn't, he has not. He has decided to use it to accomplish what he's going to accomplish in these latter days. One of the things that we're, has become very evident to us is that just one little change can change everything overnight. And, the, you know, the Lord's able to do that. God's able to uh, change anything he wants to change. He's got the wisdom, he's got the know-how, and he's got the power to do anything he wants to do to bring about his uh, purpose, 
his planned purpose. Everybody know that? God's got a planned purpose. He's righteous in what he does, and he is, God's working on uh, his purpose. And his purpose is, is to have a righteous family throughout eternity. And he's working on that today. He's working on a bride that's going to uh, uh, rule and reign for, with him for a thousand years. Now, you know, when we talk about time like that, it just sounds enormous. And um, when you talk about the fact that uh, for the last uh, near 6,000 years, uh, what God has done, and it's taken 6,000 years to do it. Think about that. That the first 2,000 years, there was a fall from the Garden of Eden by Adam and Eve. And then <clears throat> even though the righteousness of that day uh, sustained man for nearly 1,000 years, most of those uh uh, righteous men of the righteous line lived to be up eight, nine hundred. You know, Methuselah was nine hundred and sixty nine years old. And all of those men lived to be old like that. Uh, but, uh, of course, corruption continued to work. Man's, uh, the Lord said that man's heart was uh, to do evil continually. And God decided that, you know, he would have to destroy the world back there with the, the flood, having Noah build the ark. And and, um, and so that was a two-day period. Peter said a thousand years with the Lord is as a day and a, and a day is as a thousand years. The Lord made everything in six days and the seventh day he rested. Well, it was 2,000 years that took place uh, in the antediluvian world, a world before the flood. And then there was, uh, from Abraham to Christ, was another 2,000-year period in the Jewish world. And uh, <clears throat> finally, in the Jewish world, it took God 4,000 years or four prophetical days there to finally make up a portion of his bride for the world to get ready for Jesus to come in that world back there. That uh, And if you'd been living in that time, and even when you go back and read about it, you wonder how in the world was it ready for the Lord to come? When you looked at it, you think, it ain't time for God to come. You know, I'm sure the people back there... Uh, they, of course, they didn't understand the coming of the Lord the way we look back on it and see how, what actually did happen. They had many different ideas about the coming Messiah as a natural king over their natural nation and uh, many things, many thoughts that they had about it. They didn't know how it was going to come about. But God brought Jesus into that world back there as a baby, as a child. He had to grow up and uh, he had to first become of the human nature and become uh, of the seed of Abraham. And he had to endeavor living in this corrupt world and he had to learn righteousness and he had to uh, overcome. Uh, he was tempted, the Bible says, in Hebrews 2 and Hebrews 4 and and he was tempted in like manner as we are. He had to overcome temptation, and he did. And he lived above sin. He was the second man, Adam, Paul talked about, that he finished the work that Adam failed at. And uh, But it, my point is, is that it took 4,000 years for God to be able to cause men and women to be born again not of the corrupt nature of the fallen Adamic nature. See, Adam was made of God. He was, he was God's child, but we weren't made of God. We were made of Adam. We're, we're uh, uh, of the lineage of a fallen nature of the first man, Adam. 
And uh, that's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. It took God 4,000 years to take fallen man and get him in a condition that he could be born of God's nature, born again of the, of the Holy Spirit, of the Spirit of God. It took 4,000 years for that. And then from the falling away of the early church until the end of the Gentile world, is it going to be another 2,000 years? Today we're in 2020. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, there's different dates on the day of Pentecost, but but one relied on is AD 33. And uh, so that we're what? Uh, 12 and a half years away from a 2,000 year period of another 2,000 year world or two days, two days or 2,000 years in the Antediluvian world, two days or 2,000 years in the Jewish world, two days and 2,000 years in the Gentile world, six days. And then the seventh day will be the millennial reign, a thousand year millennial. And But here's the thing I wanted to bring up is the bride of Christ God's working on making up his bride right now. He made up a portion of it in the in the end of the Jewish world in that early church with the divine order of God that had a full sevenfold life, a complete understanding. The church then fell away after God finished harvesting what he could harvest out of that world, and he started all over with a new world of the Gentiles. And here we are, almost 2,000 years later, and we're, we're edging on the end of this world. But when God finishes making up the remainder of his bride in a restored church in the end of this world, he's going to take the bride and they will rule and reign with him for the thousand years millennial. Now think about it. In 1,000 years, they're going to accomplish bringing righteousness to the whole world. Isaiah said if a man dies in that 1,000-year period of time, he'll be uh, uh, cursed. If he dies at 100 years old, he'd be accursed. So men will begin to live again uh, during the 1,000 years. In fact, some will overcome sin and live right on, take on in, uh, everlasting life uh, down, down through the thousand years. And so the bride, the help that Jesus is going to get with the bride of Christ to rule and reign with him is going to accomplish in 1,000 years more than what's been accomplished in 6,000 years. And it still sounds like a long period of time, but when you think about what's going to be accomplished, that all corruption is going to be, uh, uh, you know, removed. It's going to be defeated. It's going to finish. Righteousness is going to prevail in the end. Uh, I want to be a part of that, don't you? I want to be a part of that world. And uh, I want to be a part of that where there is no more tears. There's no more sorrow. Uh, there's peace and happiness forevermore. Well, when everybody's righteous, you know, I don't know what that world's going to be like. You know, I don't even know if we need a house. <laughs> you know, what houses are, there's protection. It's protection from elements, you know, storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, heavy rains. Well, in the garden, there was none of that. There wasn't even rain. It just, the, the dew came up in the morning or in the night and uh, watered the earth, and everything was tropical. There wasn't any thorns and thistles. There wasn't any, I said one time, I said, I don't know if we'll have any, I don't think we'll have any insects. They're part of the uh, curse that came on the earth. But I said, if there's a, if there's a, a mosquito, he's going to have a different job throughout eternity if he's going to live at all because he ain't going to be sucking the blood out of people. <laughs> that's just, you know, I mean, that's just more or less a joke. But but uh, uh, again, do you need a house? You certainly wouldn't need any any 
locks on the doors. You won't need any windows to keep any elements out. Uh, you know, so I don't even know that you need. I, what's that world going to look like? What's it going to be like? I don't know, but I want to be a part of it because I know if everything's going to be joy and peace and happiness, no more tears, no more sorrow, and the the elements and sin's going to be eradicated, then what a what a world to live in throughout eternity. This is just a moment uh, down here in this short period of time that we live that um, in comparison, how did Paul say it in Romans? He said, the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. That glorious uh life of eternity in peace and happiness. Who who doesn't want to go? Somebody said, uh, said uh, you know, a preacher, he asked his church, he said, how many of you want to go to heaven? Now, almost everybody raised their hand. There was one old man that didn't raise his hand and he, the preacher asked him, he said, sir, you don't want to go to heaven? He said, oh yeah. He said, I want to go but he said, it sounded to me like he was getting up a load to go tonight. <laughs> and he wasn't ready to go right then. Well, I'm almost in the same condition he is. I, I don't feel like that I've finished my course yet. I'm still fighting a good fight. I haven't gave up my fight. I'm still fighting this fight. And I intend to finish my course. And therefore, there is a... A, a crown of righteousness laid up for me. Paul gave me that promise. And so I'm still fighting that fight. I'm not ready to go tonight, but I'm working on it. And uh, when I reach a place like it says here, let's go back to Psalms 24. It says, verse two says, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Well, the sea represents, uh, the angel told John in Revelations, it represents peoples, nations, and tongues. Jesus founded uh, this earth. You know, he brought up uh, the earth, separated the water from the earth. But if you look at it spiritually, he has separated his people from all of the ungodly and all of the world, whatever's in the world, but his people is a different chosen selected people called the lady, the elect lady. We're, we're elected of God. We, we, God uh, searched us out. He reached out and found us. We responded to his call and we're, uh, we're still uh, in, in that race uh, running for our lives, our, our ev that everlasting life, that is. And he established it on the floods. Well, uh, there's been many floods that, that man has made. If you look at it in a spiritual way, you know, the flooding at, of Jordan at harvest time, it overflows its banks. The, uh, that that uh, God was able to take his people through that flood. There's been in many floods of corruption and of mankind that has hindered man's walk and it's hindered the work of God. But God's always brought his people through those floods of corruption and he still has a remnant of people today that is marching forward to the promised land of everlasting life. And so... Uh, then verse three says, who shall ascend? Here's the question. Who shall ascend into the hill uh, uh, of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Uh, remember the holy place, you know, the, the temple had an outer court. It had three compartments, an outer court, a holy place, and a holy of holies. The Moses' tabernacle was the pattern for that. It had those three place, places also. Excuse me, my wife made me a cup of coffee. I don't know if she thought I was going to go to sleep on this message or not, but I'm not going to let it get too cold. 
thank you for uh, bearing with me. Um, this holy place, these three places, the outer court, that's where we're at today. We're in the outer court. In the outer court, there was a gate, the eastern gate, to get in the gate and then go from the gate with your sacrifice, with a priest to help you sacrifice your offering on the brazen altar. That's where our sacrifice is today. That's where we continue to offer up our sacrifice before the Lord. Uh, the, the picture, the gate is faith. We get in this by faith. <clears throat> God does that for us. He gives us the anointed word of God which is the faith uh, that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, the work of God that was in him. And there's where we find on that brazen altar repentance and sanctification. Uh, repentance, water baptism, uh, the uh, plan of salvation of getting in this. And we continue to, uh, in our repentance, Remember, saints, repentance is not just saying I'm sorry for what I've done in the past that was wrong. It's saying I have chosen and proclaimed that I'm going to walk another way, not with the world, but with the people of God. Uh, that's what repentance means, turn and go another way. And uh, so that brazen altar, we're still in the holy place, offering our sacrifices continually and then the high priest goes to the, or not the high priest, but just the priest even. But it, but uh, it's carried out through the priesthood from the high priest down. Uh, the priest goes to the laver. Remember that was made with look, women's looking glasses. Those were brazen polished uh, glasses, uh, uh, what we would call today a mirror. But that was lined in that laver that was filled with water. And when the priest washed himself in it, he could see himself. Uh, James called it the perfect law of liberty. When we look into this word of God, we see ourselves. God reveals to us the things that he wants corrected and changed in our lives and developed in this new nature, born again nature of God that we're developing and building up in at the whole while the Spirit of God is helping us to mortify, to put off the deeds of the flesh, to mortify the flesh, <clears throat> to kill uh, those things out of our lives. And so uh, uh, the Lord's helping us to develop into a place of maturity, eventually perfection, and uh this takes place. We look in the labor. We see ourselves. We're washed by the washing of the water of the word of God and uh, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God working in our lives. And then, uh, uh, you know, before the priest could go into the holy place, when he finished cleaning himself or washing himself in the labor, he had to change from a woolen garment to a linen garment. Uh, in the book of Revelation, it says the, the linen garment is the righteousness of the saints. That's what we're trying to be clothed with, clothed with righteousness. We're putting on the new man. We're taking off the clothing of the old uh, Adamic nature and putting on the, the nature or character of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God that was in Christ that also is developed in us if we continue to follow him. Finally, then uh, the priest would go into the holy place. That's where the seven golden candlesticks were and the table of showbread with the 12 loaves of unleavened bread on it. That's a picture of the early church. The, that was a candlestick church. If you remember when John was writing to the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation, he said he walked in the midst, Jesus did, 
of the seven golden candlesticks. He said those seven candlesticks were the seven churches and the seven stars were the seven angels or the bishops uh, over those churches. Well, that's what we're endeavoring in the getting back to a restored church, getting back to a divine order <clears throat> uh, of being able to have the operation of the holy place, a sevenfold light. That's a perfect, complete understanding of the word of God uh, is available. Well, let me, let me just say this to you. Uh, just because the early church had a sevenfold light and was in a divine order of God, it didn't mean that everybody walked in that. It meant that the leadership had that and people could grow and develop. It was available. And uh, so uh, that uh, people came in, the body of Christ, they came in, they began to learn the doctrine, they began to understand the order, and they began to put off the deeds of the flesh and, and began to put on the clothing of righteousness that they were taught that was in Christ Jesus. And uh, develop, and if they continued their work and finished it, they made the bride. And so uh, that was available back there, but just because it's available, I'm telling you, you don't start off walking completely righteous. You start off just like we have today. In this day and time, righteousness in, is imputed to you and I because of faith and because of the work of Jesus Christ. You're not righteous fully if you're not perfect and you're not, uh, hello, Brother Justin Fort. Uh, anyway, you're, you're not fully righteous yet. Righteousness has been imputed to you and you're counted righteous just like Abraham was because of his faith. Uh, but God doesn't want us to continue forever in counted righteousness or imputed righteousness. He finally wants us to develop into truly being righteous. And uh, so they started out that way in the early church, but they finished their work in righteousness. Uh, okay, so now who shall stand in his holy place? Verse four says, we're in Psalms 24, if you just came in. In verse four, it says, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully. That's a mouthful right there. Let's just say, he that hath clean hands. Well, I think you could apply that to everybody. I think it applies primarily to the ministry. The hand of God is God's ministry, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists, or evangelists and pastors. That, that's the five-fold ministry of God, and it's going to take a clean ministry to stand in the holy place and minister the, the seven-fold light to the people of God in a restored church. We're working on that right now. We have Jesus Christ, our mediator, our savior, the Messiah that has the sevenfold light and he's distributing that uh, to his ministry and we're endeavoring to get back into the holy place and operate there. Look, that they didn't, it wasn't only just a candlestick with a sevenfold light, but there was a table there. That table had four legs on it that held up the 12 loaves of unleavened bread, which was the 12, uh, the, the, it was the doctrine of the 12 apostles. The, uh, that, and 12 is the number of government in the Bible. That, uh, that was the government of God with the unadulterated word of God, no leaven in it. Leaven is, is like, bread that has yeast in it. It's puffed up with a lot of air. Right now, we're still trying to get the air out of some of our doctrine. But those four legs of that table that held it up, we've always taught that's the four major doctrines of the body that's in 
uh, Hebrews the eleventh chapter. Uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews the the uh, sixth chapter, being the doctrine of baptisms, doctrine of laying on the hands, doctrine of resurrections, doctrine of eternal judgment. Those four doctrines are the are the the major four doctrines of the Bible. Every doctrine in the Bible fits in those four doctrines, and that's what holds up the the unleavened bread of the 12 loaves of the government of God and the truth of God's word uh, without any guile in it. Do you know what guile is? Guile is deceit. It's falsehood. We have to get falsehood out of everything. And so there has to be clean hands in the natural. You got to have clean hands. You can't have blood on your hands you can't, you've got to learn how to operate righteously towards, not only towards God, but towards your brother and, and your sister. We've got to learn how to treat one another right. And uh, we're, we're having to learn that. We're having to work that out, aren't we? Having to live and understand the charity or the uh, love of God. I'm talking about the agape love, not brotherly love, but the love of God that we develop into the same love in our character that he has. And remember this, love is not just passive to let anything and everything happen. Love disciplines. Love is knows the difference between right and wrong. Love wisely administers righteousness and it administers a stand against corruption and evil. And so God is, is a God's a God of love and and he's a God of judgment. Because God judge because love doesn't allow true love doesn't allow anything to happen. He chastises, Paul said, those who he loves uh not for his sake, but for your and my sake, for the the recipient of, of chastisement. Uh, so clean hands, we gotta have, we gotta be clean in what we do, what we put our hands to, and what our ministry does has to be clean. And a pure heart, our heart, we gotta have pure motive. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus said. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven that, you know, we, we gotta get our heart right. We gotta get our intent right. Listen, you can have, you can be, uh, you can have a lot of baggage from a lot of things that happens to you in this life that you'll have to get rid of if you're going to be righteous. You can't be vindictive. You cannot sit and think of how to do things that is vindictive to your brother, to your sister, to whoever. You can't. You know, somebody does something that you don't like and it bothers you and you do something back. That's vindictive. That's not the right spirit. We can't have that. We can't, we have to realize if somebody does us wrong, that's, that's sin working in their life. We can't do them wrong and let sin in our life respond. Brother Ray Linegar used to give us a teaching about responding and reacting. They're very, they're synonymous in true meaning. But his purpose in giving that was this, that if you respond in the flesh when something happens to you, and, you know, he taught that that's not the right spirit. Learn to react in the spirit. Learn to be still. Not letting yourself respond in a fleshly corruptible way in when something happens to you. And God knows, you know, we, we have to have help and growth in God to keep keep from that. So many things happen. You know, we've got this deal now in technology with texting. And you know, we, I, there's some things about texting. It, it's very uh, beneficial in many ways. But in another way, it's it's not so beneficial because sometimes somebody sends you a text, 
they didn't say it just right or you read it just wrong or you imagine how they were saying it or what they meant by it, you can get the wrong idea. You know, it's like the, we tell that story often about, uh, uh, you know, the man and, and his wife whose son went into the army and he was in the army and he wrote them a letter and they weren't educated. They couldn't even read. And so he wrote them a letter. And they didn't know what the letter said. And so one day, uh, the mailman, they happened to catch him bringing the mail, and they, they they had that letter. And they said, hey, hey, look, can we, can we impose on you enough to get you to read this letter to, you, to us? It's from our son, and we don't read. So he said, yeah, I'll read it to you. And it says, dear mom and dad, I don't have any money, and if you want me to come home for Christmas, you need to send me some money. And the man said, what's wrong with that boy? I ain't sending him a dime talk to me like that. Tell me what I got to do. And uh, he said, what, what's got into that boy? I didn't raise that boy, right? And so the guy, you know, he just went on, handed him the letter back. Well, the mother, you know how mothers are. A little later, somebody came by the house and, and she said, you know, uh, could I trouble you to read this letter to us? We we uh, received this letter from our son and we can't read very well or write and uh, we're just poor people and not well educated. Would you mind reading this to us? And so the lady said, I don't mind at all. So she handed it to her and it said, Dear Mom and Dad, this is your son. I don't have any money right now. And if you'd like for me to come home this Christmas, I need you to help me and send me some money. And the man said, why didn't the boy talk like that to start with? He don't, I would sure send him some money if he just talked like that to start out with. Well, it's just, you know, it's just a little story that we tell to show there's a lot of meaning in how things are said and how they're portrayed ha to have been said. And so uh, we're, we're living in a world of technology where, you know, everything is such a fast pace that uh, sometimes we can get, I'm getting back to the ideas of what causes us sometimes to get upset about things that it really wasn't in a person's heart of what we're even thinking about. And we imagine, I've seen that happen. I've seen so many people that were, number one, paranoid. Paranoia is a terrible thing. It's when you think something's happening and it's not happening. You know, there's there that, that's happened to me a lot as a pastor where people think that I was talking to them when I was behind the pulpit. I won't say that I never know that I'm hitting on somebody's case when I'm talking, but I will tell you this, I have worked hard to not use the pulpit as a whipping post. I don't believe in that. I don't think it's right. I don't run people, God's people up a flagpole for everybody to see if I've got a problem with somebody in my church, I'll go to them individually and talk to them about it. Um, anyway, so... Uh, we're we're asking God to help us to to uh, ascend into His holy hill or His holy place, uh, and it's someone who has a pure heart. Uh, sometimes you know Jeremiah said, "The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it?" Well, if God don't help you, if you don't wash your if you don't wash your your life, your behavior, your character in the labor looking into this perfect law of liberty, you may not know or see yourself or know the, the error that's in your life, but God, God will help us. If we'll lean on the Lord and we'll, we'll depend on him and, and, and be diligent in the reading and, and practicing the word of God and uh, endeavoring to uh, keep the things that God has gave us and develop and continue to develop in them, not lifted up his soul unto vanity. That word vanity right there means falsehood. If you look it up, the Greek word 
primarily means falsehood or lies, but it also means things that are of no good. You know, you, in other words, you can give your life over to uh, things that things of this world. You remember what Jesus taught about the parable of the sower, how that the thorns can choke out the word of God that's been given us. We can get our focus on the things of this world and actually choke out the righteous things of God. You can get your mind on natural things so much that you lose the focus of your spiritual life. I've seen people do that. I've seen people put their natural life up above the kingdom of God. I'll tell you right now today, when you sacrifice and put God and his kingdom and the work of God ahead of everything else in your life, God will bless you above measure. And if you don't, you'll make a, you'll make a, it's like a slippery slope. You'll begin to slide backwards in your walk with God and you put all your emphasis on the things of this world for what? For what? A temporal life of a few years to bless yourself or to endeavor to labor on the things of God and not the things of this life? That has to be first in us. Many people have made the mistake of putting that second. It takes sacrifice. It takes sacrifice to make up your mind that I'm going with the people of God and I'm not going off somewhere by myself or doing my thing or, or putting everything that I want to do in life up and above the things of God. And sometimes that means I will refuse to make great finances and great money in life. You know, I'd rather, I'll take, I'll take the other route and I'll go with the people of God I'm looking for righteousness and eternal life, not for temporal things. Yes, God will bless you with temporal things. God will bless people. You know, if you've been faithful to God, and this happens to people, people be faithful to God and God will bless them. Even if they do get out of focus, God, it's like they've got a bank account in heaven and they pay into that account. You can turn and begin to focus and do wrong and God's judgment, let me give you a scripture in Ecclesiastes that says, because judgment is not executed speedily, it's fully set in the mind of man to do evil. In other words, because God doesn't judge things right away, you're borrowing out of your account. I've seen that. I've seen men that turned away from God, that God didn't judge them for many years. They wound up in judgment. They lost out with God before it was over. But they borrowed, or they didn't borrow, but they were able to draw out of the count that they built up a grace in their life while they did serve God. And they drew out of that and drew out of that to find there wasn't anything else to draw. That because judgment's not executed speedily, you think God don't care. You know, look, Here's what I've done. God hasn't killed me. He hasn't judged me for it. When they don't understand God's judgment. They don't understand how God judges things. Anyway, so this pure heart and not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. See, you deceitful means you can deceive yourself. You can swear, you know, this is what I'm going to do. You can, you can, deceive yourself in ideology of man's mind rather than the word of God and the things of God and God knowing God's mind on things. Excuse me, I'm going to have to take another sip of coffee. Anyway, so we can, we can swear. If we're not careful, we'll swear deceitfully. We'll, we will make up our mind, you know, that this is what I'm going to do. And we can deceive ourselves into believing that it's all right when we don't hold to the principles that, uh, that God has given us. Yeah, sister, and you've got mercy stored up, but keep storing it up. Don't just draw off of it. Don't keep, don't, it's like having a bank account and keep drawing money out, but you never make a deposit. We got to keep making deposits of, of mercy 
we got to keep adding mercy to our account by the life we live. God gives us mercy because of his favor on us and how we're putting the, the things of God in the forefront in our lives. That pleases God and he gives us favor over it. Uh, and hath not lift up their soul into vanity and sworn deceitfully, he, look what it says, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. That's Israel. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Remember, gates are ministers. Uh, you can become a gate. You know, you can follow a minister in a place that you're able to open up the ways of salvation to those that follow you and your example. Uh, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors. See, we can be a door in the kingdom of God. And the king of glory shall come in. So if we, if we keep our heads lifted up looking to him and our faith towards him and uh, remain being a gate or a door. The king of glory will come in. Look what he said in verse eight. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, you everlasting doors. The king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Selah. You know what that word Selah means? Think about it. Meditate on this. Think about this precious chapter of prophecy that's in the Bible that tells us how to ascend into his holy hill and stand in his holy place. That holy place is, it's like the Garden of Eden. Remember the second chapter of Joel? That Joel began to prophesy. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, he said, this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. That prophecy of Joel was concerning the early church and the day of Pentecost and the work of the Lord in that time. And he said that there was a strong people that the world had never seen anyone like them, nor have would they ever see any more like them for many generations. That That's referring to us, the restored church down here. He said, Eden is before them. That church was headed. They were ascending. They were headed into the holy place or the paradise of God that was that restored that was that divine order and that's the restored church we're looking for is to get back into the garden of Eden did you know Jesus lived without sin it's because he was in the garden he <clears throat> he was the only child of God that lived in his day until people began to be born again after he died, resurrected, and sent the Holy Ghost back on the day of Pentecost. He was the only man that could dwell in Eden. He was the only son of God, the child of God. He was No other man was born of God. We were all born of corruptible, fallen nature of Adam. But Jesus was a son of God. He, he was born of Mary. He took on the seed of man. He was a human, but he was also born of God. He had the nature of God in him. And he lived in a, a divine order with God. God uh, brought him into that place. He lived in that place and he was able. He had the power to live above sin. And when we get in the place that that early church was in and develop into that place, we can get into the sevenfold life, the holy, holy place of God. We can live above sin. In fact, I'll say this. You and I 
or uh, we're going to have to live above sin for some time before we reach perfection. Adam was in the garden. He lived above sin until he fell. Paul, Jesus lived above sin, but he didn't finish his course until hanging on the cross. He said, it is finished. That's what God called him to do. What God calls you and I to do is finish our course in overcoming sin. And here's what Paul said. He said, I fought a good fight and I finished my course. And he said, there is therefore laid up for me a crown of righteousness and not for me only, but those who love his appearing. Now that appearing is talking about when he appears in your life. It was a, it appeared in Paul's life. He he made it. Uh, Peter made it. Peter stated. He said, "I the Lord has showed me that I must soon put off this tabernacle." He, he you know Paul said that that if th this house be dissolved, there is another house. Uh, and it's talking about a new body, a bride. A bride, a, a member, being a member of the bride. Well, we all are striving for that place to enter in and not only enter, but stand in the holy place. To get back in the Garden of Eden, to live above righteous, above sin, in righteousness, to, and, and to live that way until we finish our course, till God's satisfied that we have finally uprooted that Adamic nature, that corruptible nature, and that we are fully developed in perfection in the nature of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we'll rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Let me say this. Um, those of you who come in late, those of you who didn't see, when I finish here, I will post this. It'll be on my Facebook page. If you have any questions, I put on here, you can text my phone number. I put it on there. You should be able to see it. It's 501-425-9842. Uh, you can text me if you have questions. I also put on my email address, ifrsmith at aol.com. You can email me your questions. I'll be, I will do my best to answer your questions, get back to you on it. For those of you in the Dominican Republic, I want to uh, thank you for listening today, and and I want you to know that I'm we're hopefully I'm hoping maybe next Friday, but as soon as possible we're going to start a either a Zoom meeting or a Google Meet meeting, uh, and we're going to begin All to right, teach the to successions that. Uh, of the prophetical things that has to transpire before the end of the Gentile world. There's several things that I want to talk to the Dominicans about that I have talked some on here. Again, those of you that have come on late, this will be posted as soon as I'm finished and uh, you, can, you can watch it on my Facebook page. It will also be posted on the Facebook page on, on our website uh, firstgospelchurch.church that's the name of our website firstgospelchurch.church hi brother Fide he's from Guatemala God bless you uh, you can watch it on, on our Facebook page there it will be also on our, our website there and brother Painter is also posting it on YouTube and it is archived so and I've asked him to begin to title and label these broadcasts. Brother Painter, I want you to label this one Psalms 24 to stand in the holy place uh, so that you people can go back and see the titles and know what you're so you don't have to listen to the whole thing to know which one you're wanting to listen to or if you've already listened to it. So anyway, those are, that, that was a succession of prophetical things that need to transpire before the end of the Gentile world, we'll label them the succession of prophetical events in the end of our world 
part one, part two, part three, and so forth. Uh, I'm hoping I can get Brother Painter, if he hadn't already labeled them, to get them la labeled. Dios te bendiga, mi hermano Calderon. <laughs> Sister, Brother Calderon's wife, Antia, she just came on. And so, anyway, God bless you all. I'm trying to hold these sessions to about an hour, and so my hour's uh, about up. Uh, I love all of you. Uh, remember to pray for Brother Jeff Pryor had his eyes. Uh, he had surgery. I don't know if his laser or what it was he had today, but he came through it fine, according to Sister Pryor, and uh, he's resting and been sleeping this evening. So uh, Brother Painter told us first gospel church dot com I thought it was not okay first gospel church dot com or first gospel church dot church they both work I think um anyway um uh, uh pray for brother Pryor pray for brother uh Shelby Weaver he's had a stroke uh I don't, I don't know I haven't heard any news today on him but anyway please continue to pray for him um uh, trying to think of who else we need to pray for. Uh, Brother Gary Wright in Humble, Texas. Uh, we need to keep him, keep holding him up in prayer. And uh, remember Brother Bud in Nacogdoches, te Texas. You know, his wife, he lost her about three months ago and or four. And so it's, it's, a, it's a difficult time adjusting uh, uh, when you lose a loved one, especially a uh, uh, a spouse that's been your spouse for well over 50 years. And so uh, keep Brother Bud in your prayers. Pray for the body of Jesus Christ. Pray for the leaders of our states, our nation, and our world. The Bible tells us to do that. Let's pray that God, I'm praying God would hold back, keep holding back the four winds till you get your servants sealed in their foreheads. Uh, God, I'm praying that the Lord would give us a little more time. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm hoping that we can, we can keep in the United States of America enough conservatism that we're holding on to Jesus Christ and uh, the things of God and that we're not turning over to a nation that is totally, completely turned away from God. Uh, the Bible said that if you do that, he'll turn you into hell. And uh, this nation, we need to pray for our nation. Uh, please pray for Brother Leo uh, Bergenheim from Birmingham. He's had a stroke. His blood clot on his brain, and they need they need prayer. So remember that. It's from Sister Laura Lucas telling us that. So remember Brother Ber Bergenheim. Uh, Brother Leo in Bir Birmingham. Uh, all right, God bless your hearts. I love you all. I'll see those of you that are here in the local church Sunday morning, Bible study in the dining room. We still will have, we're going to have this week, coffee, donuts, oatmeal, yogurt with fruit, um, and uh, fellowship. You know, we've been having to stay away from each other. We're still practicing uh, spacing. We're trying to be careful, be wise in all that we do. And so uh, the families are sitting together, but we have a large enough facility and dining room that we can space properly and easily be six feet from each other. Uh, and so those of you who would like want to wear a mask, feel free to do so. We have uh, antibacterial uh, for the hands when you come in the door. And uh, so, but, you know, let's be free in the spirit to let the Lord touch us. I so appreciated the spirit of God that we felt this past Sunday. God bless your hearts. I'll see you Sunday morning. Those of you that are abroad and in different states, I'll be back on here next Thursday at 7, 8, 7 p.m. God bless you. Those of you in the Dominican Republic will be announcing to you and letting the pastors there know as soon as possible when we're going to start this 
broadcast to the Dominican Republic with interpretation into Spanish. So we're working on that diligently and we'll have it up and running as soon as possible. God bless you and good night. Pray for me and I'll pray for you.